Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast titled Innovation and the Future of Technology, Artificial Intelligence and Bots. I'm Vince Martinez, Executive Government Advisor at Avaya. I will be your moderator today. If we look at NASIO's 2020 state CIO top uh, 10 priority list, cybersecurity and risk are number one, digital government is number two, and cloud is number three. Today, our panel discussion centers around artificial intelligence and bots, an important component of uh, digital government. Cyber risk and cloud are important to be considered when discussing digital government or are pertinent to any dis technology discussion as we move forward. So let's jump right in uh, with our panel introductions. Uh, joining me today is a esteemed panel of CIOs with a wealth of experience forging a path in innovation in state government. I'm honored to be hosting this panel discussion with you today. And first we'll introduce Curtis Wood. Curtis uh, serves as the Cabinet Secretary and Chief Information Officer uh, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Next is Heather Hall. Heather Hall serves uh, as a Chief Information Officer uh, at Texas Workforce Commission. And next we have J.R. Sloan. J.R. is the state CIO at the, de at the Arizona Department of Administration. And uh, last but not least, we have Joshua Spence, was named technolo uh, Chief Technology Officer for the state of West Virginia Office of Technology in November of 2018. Thank you all for uh, participating today and welcome. So let's dive right uh, right into our discussion on AI and bots, where uh, you know each of the panelists will share their respective use cases, lessons learned, uh, customer experiences, and any thoughts in moving forward with the technology. And so, Jr., we'll start off with you. Uh, I know you've uh, implemented AI and bots within a couple of departments. You know, please, uh, you know, share with the group uh, an overview of some of the use cases and, and the lessons learned. Uh, in going through that process. Well, thanks, Vincent. Um, yeah, I think when we look at uh, the use of AI and, and bots, you know, the overarching thing we're trying to do is is bring automation to the table, right? We're trying to offload uh, the work uh, and, and free free our employees to do higher, more value added um, activities. And and um, the other thing is that it brings scale, right? Where we can we can scale these solutions to serve more more citizens, more businesses. Uh, more rapidly uh, than we can add people to the equation. So that's the that's the main thing we're trying to do um, in applying these technologies. Um, in the state of Arizona, there are a couple of examples that, that I wanted to talk about. Um, one very relevant to you know, having come through, and actually we're still in obviously the, the period of the pandemic, but um, yeah, I think a lot of us feel like we're, we're over uh, the worst of maybe the UI uh, tsunami that, that, that hit many of us. Um, and that was in our Department of Economic Security. So uh, they had, had chatbots deployed for some eligibility applications. They brought it over into, uh, into the UI uh, um, solution. And that really helped uh, the overall solution scale from uh, what was a steady state of like maybe 15,000 applicants to over 2 million applicants um, in the course of you know, 30 to 45 days. Um, and so this was you know, really, you know, starting to say, well, what what questions can we answer where we can just, you know, close out that interaction um, in 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 a, in a single touch, and then in what other ways can we help to engage with the citizen, you know, the applicant, um, direct them to the right resources, and or ultimately direct them to the right agent, uh, so that they can more rapidly be serviced. And so this was all about optimizing the fact that, you know, uh, at that time. You know, uh, frankly, our department was, I think, still very much reacting to this this uh, immediate spike and uh, bringing people on, getting them trained, getting them on the phones. That takes time. And so being able to uh, apply uh, chatbot technology to help us uh, scale faster uh, was, was critical to our overall response. And, and it's still part of the, the strategy today just to optimize uh, how, we, how we utilize those agent resources that are, I mean, they're they're precious. They can only, you know, they can answer questions that nobody, you know, that, that automated systems can answer. And so we want to make sure that we're we're using them um, appropriately. Um, another example that I'll, I'll talk about uh, is uh, a password reset solution that we put in place. Um, we recently had a, our main uh, HR uh, internal HR system for the state uh, went through an upgrade, and all the all the users uh, had to go through a password reset. And so. 
that normally would just come into the service desk. We had some, you know, uh, the typical automated online, you know, go to this web page, you can reset your password there. Um, and that works for that works for pe some people, but doesn't work for everybody. When you're when you're dealing with, in this case, uh, you know, 40 to 50,000 uh, folks that need to reset their password in a pretty short order. Um, you know, uh, having the right solution uh, that's, that's easily accessible and kind of meets people where where they want to be serviced. And so we put that as part of our, our uh, call center solution um, and directed people there first to say, you know, let's see if we can uh, reset your password here. So the great news is that, I mean, with that, uh, with a natural language interface and being able to, to walk people through that, we were able in, in the first, uh, you know, 30, 60 days, uh, handle like 45,000 password resets. Um, successfully for folks. And this allowed, again, our, our service desk agents to focus on more productive tasks. They're resolving tickets for people. They're doing things that, that can't be automated. And so, um, again, I think that's that kind of supports the theme of really what are we trying to do with, with these chatbots? And it's it's provide, you know, make information accessible, um, make, uh, you know, tasks that can be completed automated uh, to automate those. Yeah. Thanks, Jr. That's that's great, and it, and it certainly you know improves the overall you know customer experience. You know, Heather, I know you've had some uh, issues on the UI, similar, very similar. Um, how did you start your chatbot in this initiation, and and discuss some of the, the customer experience and and the lessons that you've learned that and any adjustments that uh, that you had to make along the way. Sure. So yes, very similar uh, use cases as Jr. had. Um, I work for the Texas Workforce Commission, and we're the agency in Texas responsible for administering the unemployment insurance program. And we saw very early on in March with the pandemic um, and some of the new federal programs that were being um, talked about, um, our call center volume just skyrocketed. Um, just to, to set a little background, we normally take about 13,000 UI claims a week um, in normal times. and um, during the pandemic, uh, on one day, our high watermark day on April 2nd, we took 98,000 claims in one day. Um, so just to give you a, a perspective, we've taken, um, in, in five months, we took three years worth of claims. So that translates to that same volume over to our, our telecenters. So uh, very quickly, they got, um, uh, they reached capacity and we needed to figure out a different way to uh, reach our citizens or for them to to reach us and, and ask questions. So, um, you know, I challenged our team um, to, we'd been talking about trying to do a chat bot for years. And, um, you know, I challenged our team and some vendor partners to see if we could set up a chat bot in a four day window. And everyone met the challenge. We started small. Um, so we started with 10 questions and actually 20 when we, on our first day when we went live. Um, and, you know, it, it was venturing into kind of unknown territory for us. In fact, we um, actually had to, uh, we crashed our chatbot the first day that we went live with it. Um, within five hours, we had to pull it down, add more capacity, and relaunch it. So, um, you know, it's just, it's been kind of, we've been learning as, as we go with this, this adventure. But uh, we're now over, to, uh, over 100 questions in our chatbot. Um, and as of yesterday, um, our chatbot has helped 2.3 million people and answered uh, over 9.2 million questions. So I know all of those questions wouldn't have gone to a telecenter for a person to answer, but a good portion of them would. Um, we're finding that people tend to ask more questions with a chatbot than they probably would if they had to call for each individual question. But that definitely translates to hundreds of thousands of calls that didn't have to go to a person to answer that. Um, we were able to, um, as far as customer experience, we were able to find a different way to engage those citizens. Um, our website has a wealth of information, but it's not always easy to find. Uh, you may have to click more than once or twice. And, and um, you know, this is a new way for us to offer up that information to uh, citizens to get the information by them asking a question. It may be pointing them to a website that already exists or with some canned um, disambiguations is what we call them kind of that back and forth conversation. So um, we can narrow down what it is that they're looking for and point them in the right direction. Um, we also uh, employed a callback form within our chatbot. We've since moved it to a web form, but a way for people to get on a call list so that they don't have to call and wait on hold. Um, they can get on a call list and we turned one of our 
um, uh, call centers uh, into an outbound call center. So they were calling those people back that had kind of raised their hand through the chat box to say, hey, put me on the list and call me when you can. And so that's been um, very successful. Um, and we also added a, a feature within our chatbot for them to notify us if they thought that they had been a victim of identity theft. So um, we definitely see some, some uh, responses coming in on that, and that's allowing us to get those to the top of the list so we can get working on those right away. Um, and also recently in the last couple of months, we implemented um, our, our uh, uh, feedback feature. So it's a five-star scale, so people can rate you know, how their experience was. So we're learning some information from our users directly on their experience with the chatbot. So our chatbot is now six months old um, and we feel like um, it, has, it has helped us quite a bit. We adjusted course along the way, definitely have learned some lessons and continue to learn some lessons. Um, one of the things I would say is that, that um, a chatbot is not completely, or at least ours is not completely automated. It still requires some human intervention. It requires people to go in and look at what questions could the chatbot not answer and design new questions and, and new features for, for the chatbot. And um, I just think it's a really good entry point. It was a great entry point for, for our agency into the world of AI. All right. Very good, Heather. Thank you very much. I know I'm one of those that sort of likes to get to the, to the agent, right? I want to talk to a live person. I'm sure a lot of people do. You know, Josh, in, in West Virginia, uh, I know you're you're cautiously proceeding in, in this direction. Please share, uh, you know, with us some of your concerns from a customer experience perspective, especially as that uh, AI engine gains maturity. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's um, that's one of the areas that we're looking at uh, for chatbots. So, like like the other states, we we were challenged with unemployment um, uh, claims and and the demand. So. Uh, we had to address and we started implementing um, a chatbot in that in that capacity and then we've been evaluating using chatbots in some other capacities but uh, one of the things that I think we have to be careful of is in digital government we're looking at that citizen experience that customer experience with the technology and it wasn't that long I think it was within the last year back in 19 uh, there was an article in Forbes talking about uh, most people when they're contacting someone uh, company or the government, they want to talk to a human agent. They don't want to talk to technology. And um, so then are we actually helping the situation when we push them this way or not? And I, and I think the jury's still out on that, um, um, you know, because if we look at what we're doing with the chatbot, we're, we're very much trying to mimic the human. We're trying to do it to the point where uh, it's got a picture and it will have a conversation with you like a like a human would. So that kind of in my mind begs the question, like if we relate it to the 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 saying, well, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? My question would be, if a chatbot helps a human and the human doesn't realize it, is it a problem? I don't know. And I think it's going to probably maybe split along generationally um, and who you're interacting with. Um, but I think getting a feedback feature, what Heather was talking about, is an excellent way to get information back in to figure out, did they just quit, right? Did they, or did, if they went through the process, which, uh, which answers did they end up at? And then if they're willing to give you that star, right, not fill out a big long form, but simply hit, yeah, it was four stars or five stars or one star, you get that feedback to then understand, are you actually helping helping the situation or if you're not? And I think that's a real important piece to this as we want to shift ways in which the citizen can interact. So one of the things that we're looking at in West Virginia is, can we point it internally, which is what uh, JR was talking about with the password reset, right? My, you know, state employees, you know, they're an employee. So in this situation, we can say, hey, this is the tool that you need to use and you need to leverage it to, to receive that service. But when it's a citizen, it's a little different. And so I think we could point some of this um, AI and some of the uh, chatbot capability, maybe internal first. And that's what we're, we're definitely wanting to move forward with the password resets, I think a great use case. Um, Cause I know that's just a, a major time sink that right now, if you don't have an automated means in place, you're spinning. Uh, human capital on that and so I think that's a big one and then um, I think in 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 the latter part of your question you talked a little bit about 
the, the maturity of the AI engine. And I think that's uh, another key piece because you know what we're really doing is doing an evolution of an FAQ, right? Frequently asked questions. We're, we're taking that and, uh, and putting it through a AI engine that now allows the computer to have that interaction to determine what you're actually looking for in whatever language you choose to, to ask that question, because there's however many ways you can ask a question, and then provide you actually a viable response. Um, so one of the funny ones that I've seen is people will test some of the uh, uh, chatbots to determine if it's a human or not. And all of them will start, or well, not all of them, but a lot of them start with, hey, how are you? And they'll immediately reply with, my day's awful. And of course, the if it's not a very good AI engine, it'll respond, that sounds great. Uh, it doesn't really <laughs> interpret what you're saying. Um, and it's an easy way to tell that it's a computer. But um, But I think it's an interesting technology and I think it will have a place in government. Very good. Thank you, Josh. I have an interesting perspective. Really appreciate that. And Curtis, tell us a little bit about your deployment. I'm one that always likes to plan, right? I want to understand and want to know. I always used to tell my team, if you don't have a plan, you don't know what you're doing, right? So tell us how you plan and how the overall customer experience sort of sets in there. And then what is your approach to expanding AI and bots uh, moving forward? Uh, thanks, Vincent. Thanks, everybody. Good, good stuff for, by everybody. Uh, we, we experienced the same challenge with unemployment in Massachusetts. Uh, we had to stand up, you know, the pandemic unemployment, uh, you know, program fairly quickly. You know, we quickly ran into the same issues as most states, if not all states, did about capacity and being able to be uh, being overwhelmed with calls. So we were we were fortunate where we had a vendor partner that helped us, you know, with with the chatbot and you know really did a nice job. And, you know, what I found is that, uh, you know, the technology people were fine. Uh, the call center people were fine. Uh, we were a little bit nervous about, you know, what our leadership thought about, you know, kind of uh, negating our responsibility to talk to people. But uh, they soon realized that we could not handle the volume of the calls. Uh, so when we did deploy it, it, it was it was quickly adopted by our, uh, our Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development and the agency head that ran unemployment assurance. Uh, and it was really a great thing because the customer base started to, you know, get information that they were delayed uh, in getting. Uh, the same thing with, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the call center, the callback, the, you know, web forms, things that we did the same thing in Massachusetts, and it was really a godsend. Um, what I would say, though, is that uh, from where we're at today is that, um, you know, we've been looking at, you know, AI and business automation tools for a while. Uh, we're trying to find our, you know, road forward on this, I think. You know, uh, I'm a believer in not chasing technology too much. I think we do that uh, quite a bit. Uh, we chase the shiny apple. So I, I want to be very careful. I want to be prudent. I mean, I think some areas that we're definitely looking at, you know, certainly certainly our service desk, I think what JR brought up is, you know, appropriate. I think it's areas we'd love to be able to improve on that. Um, I think, you know, as we move forward in our uh, ticketing systems and our ability to kind of answer calls and, you know, defer password resets all, all on the plan, um, I think, you know, our, our mass.gov site, our digital environment, I think is certainly an opportunity there that we could certainly help with people. I mean, I, our website is similar to others. I mean, it's it's well designed, it's structured, but it still at times takes a click or two or three to get to where you need to go. So I definitely think there's an opportunity there. Uh, my digital team has been somewhat reluctant. You know, they've been they've been focused over the last couple of years. And when I say reluctant, they're still doing their work. We're still looking at web analytics. We're trying to look at behavior of people, how they interact with our website. So we're trying to gather a little bit more information. Um, I think as we move forward, we probably need to be a little bit more um, forward thinking, a little bit more aggressive in our approach to how we can interact and how we can, you know, uh, adopt certain technologies and not overthink it uh, as well. So as we move forward, we, we, we just started a, a new engagement, our customer relation management uh, review and service engagement. That's an area that I think uh, we've struggled with over the years uh, to be able to manage that, you know, multiple agents, 150 plus agencies plus the customers. And, you know, can, how, do, we really, do we really care about our customer? Do we really care about how we deliver service? And I think at times we don't. Um, you know, we're so focused on delivering the service or actually kind of the process of engaging or cost recovery, we tend to forget about, you know, how we actually deliver the service and is the customer uh, uh, pleased with our service. So I, I do think, 
you know, adding certain tools and certain mindsets and certain uh, ability to interact with people to be able to provide uh, response and immediate feedback. I do like I do like the you know the star base. I do like the kind of quick evaluation. We, you know, we got the pop up window that comes up. Did you like us? And it's very annoying at times. So I think there's opportunities to do things differently here. Uh, but as we move forward, I think we want to look at areas that uh, you know that are business cases that that are valid that are validated. I want to make sure that the business leaders understand it because I think one thing from a technology platform, it's great, but how does the business, how the agency, how do the direct care providers actually, you know, uh, you know, how do they, how do they handle that? How do they, how do they, um, uh, how do they behave? What, what's their line? What's the responsibility? And then of course, you know, the citizens really like this. I, I will say that what I have found is that, uh, and I'm one of those folks that there are days when I'm very much active and I don't want to talk to anybody and I'll just kind of send emails back and forth to people or, you know, texting and, you know, I don't really want to do, I just assume ask you a question online. Uh, but I also need to have a feel that I've, I've been able to been uh, connected to somebody. I need to, I need a response back. And I think that's where we need to be very careful of making sure that we have an appropriate response. Uh, in state government, as we know, sometimes, you know, our contact centers and our call centers, it's very difficult for people to get to the right answer if we don't have the appropriate infrastructure or the appropriate protocols or appropriate answers or routing. So I, I do think, you know, whatever we can do to improve service delivery, uh, we're all for it. And then finally, I would say again, I think for us, it's really planning this with our customer relation management model as we move forward, not only from an IT service perspective, but also from a business delivery. So there's the areas that we're looking at in Massachusetts. And I think overall, the experience here has been pretty good. Uh, but we want to take a little bit of time to make sure that we're we're you know we're we're moving in the right direction at the right pace. That's what I would offer. Thanks, Curtis. That's 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 great. That's insightful. Uh, I think that shiny red apple is really the customer experience and in working with the teams that you know are in front of those customers. You know, Jr. Uh, Curtis had some great points um, regarding you know customer experience, and Joss talks about sort of the ethical use of chatbots. Any thoughts uh, based on your experience, or Heather as well? I know you have a colorful term for um, uh, for the uh, the chat bots that get a little too close to being real people. But any thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, I, I definitely you know, the comment of you know most most customers would prefer a live agent. I mean, I think we've all you know uh, had a need you know probably in the not too distant past to pick up the phone and need to call in to a customer service line. Um, now. I think to Josh's point, uh, you know, if you knew that that an automated assistant could help you complete your transaction now, as opposed to having to wait 15, 20, 30 minutes, an hour to get through to somebody, you might feel a little different, right? And so I think that's that's where um, the challenge and both the opportunity uh, for us. And 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 I think Curtis made a great point around, you know, this is about the customer experience. And if we make the customer experience good, if we make it uh, feel seamless if we make it, uh, you know, show that they can, you know, demonstrate success, right? That they can complete the thing that they, the task they need to do. Um, then the chatbot's going to be welcomed. And it, and to Josh's point, I think it's not going to matter whether they think it's a live agent or it's not, right? I mean, you, we can have a whole separate uh, discussion around, uh, you know, is it, you know, should you make it really clear that this is not a human being or, or should it, should you make it, uh, you know, uh, sort of leave it to the individual? Um, I think there, there are some uh, generational differences in, in that, you know, uh, you know, some will pick up more easily that, uh, you know, that it's an automated solution versus, versus those that don't. Um, but yeah, the, when, you know, if the chatbot gets, uh, you know, gets too familiar um, or seems to know too much about you, yeah, I talk about that being the creepy factor, right? We don't want to get into the creepy area uh, with with our people, and and that uh, you know the solution needs to sort of stay on task, uh, stay within its within its lanes, and uh, but but it has to provide a great experience to the to the user and. Um, and I think uh, you know we talked about I know several folks talked about the training, um, listening to the transcripts of calls, finding out where it's having success, finding out where it's where it's struggling, and and there's times where uh, you know you need to make sure that that chatbot is not the dead end. You know, right. when the chatbot can no longer handle uh, the call, you've got to have a, a way to to bring that call uh, into an agent experience. Um, I think Heather talked about uh, using their chatbot to queue up callbacks. That's a great, 
you know, just classic call center, uh, you know, technology solution, which is there are, there are, you know, peaks and valleys in call volume throughout the day. And you want to use those valleys uh, to keep the agents productive because every minute they're not on the phone, you're just, you're just paying for them to sit there. Um, and so best call center practices are going to say, we'll start blending in those callbacks during those times. And, and so that's a, that's a great way, again, even just in a very simple way to use the chat bot to say, hey, would you like to schedule a callback? Well, yeah, and you can go ahead and do that. So. Yeah, thank you, Jared. Thank you. Heather, anything to add to that? Yeah, actually, um, all really, really good points. Um, I would say the other thing that we're considering is other ways that we can extend the chat bot a little bit. So one of the things we'd like to do is see if we could take, take a scenario or two and actually move those over to live chat. So we, we're not ready yet because our call centers are still <laughs> pretty much maxed out, but that's kind of the next step once we get past the, the hump of, of COVID is looking at are there good scenarios that we can support that would you know just go from a, a chatbot scenario over to actually chatting live with, with an agent. We also want to look at seeing if we can put some other features within the chat, which require some authentication, where they could make a payment request or do some simple tasks within the chat and not have to get out of that window and go and actually log into the application itself. So some other things that, that we're thinking about, and just to echo what, what Joshua and JR, I think everybody has said, is there is still a large portion of people that want to talk to a human. And that's the number one feedback item that we get on our five-star rating. If you give us a, a low, we ask for some more details. And uh, almost everybody that gives us a low score, it's just simply because they wanted to talk to a person. Yeah. So we still have that hurdle. Very good, very good. Yeah, I like that technical term, the creepy factor. And with Halloween around the corner there, uh, that's, that's appropriate. So I, we're coming uh, to the end of our time here. Uh, we probably have a minute for any you know, short comment by anyone. Is there anything else anyone would like to add? Kurt? Yeah, yeah, this is Kurt. So I, I would just, you know, in, in summation, what everybody's just talking about, I mean, great stuff. And congratulations to all of you. Because I, I think, you know, what I was most proud of is the way our organization was able to step up and, you know, uh, help out during the pandemic and continue to do that. I was very, very pleased. Uh, one area that I, I like to focus on, though, is also managing expectations because we need to be very careful to make sure that people don't think this is a solve everything today right. thing and you can do away with people tomorrow and we can do all this cost reduction and cost avoidance because that's that's an area that I hear whispered in my ear once in a while, you know, about uh, doing doing this type of technology and doing AI. And I, I think, you know, at least in my organization, we're not prepared to do that, you know, certainly you know, entertain business automation tools and AI. But I, I think, you know, we have a long way to go in government, especially government, where we have to deal with people directly uh, and the services that we offer in government is much different than, than others. So I, I think we need to make sure that we reinforce that to our, our financial people and our people that are into the cost efficiency and, you know, cut models. And we all know who those folks are and we're, and we're all obligated to, to do the same. And there's no doubt. And we certainly want to you know, make sure we're efficient, we're a better operation, and we're do, reaching our customers. But I do think we need to kind of keep that in the bed, back of our heads to make sure that we, you know, we 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 prepare people, especially executive leadership or legislative le leadership, to understand, um, you know, manage expectations is, is important to me on this one. That's a <clears throat> that's a great point, Curtis. You know, or the next thing you know, they cut your budget, right? And then you're trying to figure out what's going on, and they're expecting miracles, right? So, yeah, you know, Avion, like many of the companies, uh, you know, has helped several customers throughout the pandemic. It, it was it was remarkable how all these states work in terms of just positioning yourself and happy, having to react so quickly and, and enhance that customer experience. My approach uh, has always been uh, on innovation projects, is especially impacting the customers, to start from the customer experience outcome first, right? And then sort of work back, backwards. It's sort of counterintuitive, but it seems to work. You can always select the platform. You can always select the technology uh, after you determine what that impact is going to be to folks. So thank you to all the panelists. This was a great discussion, uh, and I really appreciate all of you attending today and putting in some time on this. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vince. Thanks for having us.